Today we are having a conversation with uh, Claire Campion from Anyways Creative, uh, an amazing branding creative agency that uh, done a lot of fantastic work. And let me quickly share some of the examples that you've probably seen. Uh, the, the Sonos experience, uh, you've probably seen the the Pinterest, uh, incredible multi-sensory experience with smells and tastes and lots of different things. Uh, and of course, the Adobe creative uh, types experience that a lot of you, including me, uh, did the test and uh, I really enjoyed not just the results of the test, but also the experience, uh, which again, um, only shows how amazing the whole creative campaign was. So, uh, how are you doing today, Claire? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, calling in from my little flat in Camberwell, so getting used to this life. <laughs> uh, nice, nice. I, I love the Camberwell area. I used to live uh, in Dulwich, so... Oh, uh, yeah, very close yeah. by. Yeah, very close by. It's nice and green there. Yeah, it is. We've got lots of trees and plenty of green areas, so we're lucky enough. Oh, fantastic. I have um, a bit of a starter for both of us. Uh, I have 10 questions for you, which are very quick. Um, don't think too much. <laughs> and um, yeah, we'll try to get through them as quick as possible. Just say first thing that comes into mind. Fantastic. Ready? Yeah, sure. Um, amazing. <laughs> okay. Um, so what is the first thing you do when you get up in the morning? Um, at the moment, I'm trying to get out of the flat as the first thing that I do. Um, even if we're only allowed out once a day, it really helps me to go out and take in a little bit of the world before I sit down and start some work. That sounds good. Are you a morning or a night person? Um, morning for work. Creatively, I work best in the morning when we're having meetings and, and having catch-ups and coming up with ideas. But I do slip off into evening time with my personal work and hobbies as well. So I, th I think work-wise, you're better to catch me in the morning. <laughs> Good. Uh, so it seems like you're a 24-hour person. Um, uh, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> great. Songo artist, uh, you can listen on repeat forever. Ooh, um, an artist I can listen to on repeat are The National. And so that was great to work with them on Sonos because we had to listen to their music over and over again. <laughs> so that was a bit of a dream project for me um, because I really love them. And they're, they're someone I can go back to again and again. So I was pleased that that project didn't ruin The National for me. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. OK, that's, that's great. Are you, uh, do you um, count yourself as an introvert or an extrovert? I'm an introvert for sure. Intro yeah, yeah. Good. How do you take your coffee? I'm not a coffee person. If I do take coffee, I take it with loads of milk and sugar so that it's more like a coffee flavored milkshake. <laughs> Can't believe it, a creative person who doesn't drink coffee. Oh no. Uh, describe yourself in three words. Um, clumsy. Um, constantly doing something. That's not a word. So active, let's say. And... Um, What's the third word? Mm, jittery. <laughs> interesting, interesting combination. But I get the picture. Um, yeah. What is the one thing that annoys you the most? Um, the one thing that annoys me the most, I'm gonna go gross on this, things left in the sink, old food <laughs> left in the sink. <laughs> okay. Um, what is the thing that you're most afraid of? Um, I, I'm quite afraid of being bored. I'm quite afraid of not being fulfilled and sitting there and not feeling like I'm up to much. Um, that's definitely a fear of mine and, and something I'm always conscious of about the future. I think that's a, it's a good creative fear to have. Favourite font? Oh, God. Um, I quite like some of the old style ones. I love Bodoni. Nice, classic. Yeah. yeah. And the last question, a book that changed your life? Ah, uh, see with books, I, I read a lot of fiction. I really love fiction um, to make me escape. Um, um, I guess creatively a book that made me think in a very different way was a classic, Ways of Seeing by John, John Berger. Um, but book-wise, I'm big into fiction. I read loads of fiction because it puts my brain in a different place and lets me escape the world for, for a while, and I really love that. 
Brilliant. I love it. Um, so you've, you've done the 10 questions. Well done. Uh, <laughs> hopefully it wasn't too stressful. Uh, now we can relax and have a bit more in-depth conversation about lots of interesting topics. Uh, and to kick it off, uh, could you tell uh, a bit more about your creative experience and how you ended up in Anyways Creative? Because you, you worked in a variety of different agencies before and what actually led you to Creative World in the first place? Yeah, sure. Um, so I... I grew up in quite a creative household in that my, my brothers and sisters are, are quite creative. Um, so I grew up in a house where they, they were a lot older than me and they were going to art college and it was always something that appealed to me. Um, and I studied in Dublin, uh, visual communications, which was a very broad course. Um, I find it funny that, that, that title of a course because to communicate visually is such a, <laughs> a wide world. Um, and I moved to London the day after my degree show finished. So I was eager to get here. Um, and yeah, I, I was quite, uh, I, um, I contacted Kevin Palmer, who is a co-founder of Kin, which is an interaction design studio. He'd actually been my external examiner in Dublin. So I was a little bit cheeky and, and sent him an email when I got here. And he offered me an internship, which was fantastic. It was really my first foray into um, into the real creative world, the real creative industries. And um, yeah, after some time, he, he offered me a position of studio assistant, which was not a creative role, but was better than the pizza restaurant I was working in. <laughs> and um, yeah, he, 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 it was made very clear that it wasn't a design role, but I was working in a design studio and I was surrounded by amazing people doing great work. And it certainly wasn't my dream job. There was a lot of um, replenishing the fruit stocks and answering phone calls and things like that. But I basically stuck around for long enough that they started giving me design tasks. And after a year or so there, I, I was offered a design position, which was great. Um, so it was good to stick it out. Um, I spent a long time at Kin. Um, I spent eight years there. Um, we did a lot of um, museum and cultural work. Muse uh, Kin do, yeah, lots of interactive installations and exhibition work. And I was, I learned so much there. It was a great introduction to the, the industry. And yeah, I was there for a long time and grew with the company. So when it became time for me to leave there, I, I was quite nervous actually about stepping out into the the London creative landscape because I'd been a little bit incubated in, in this one place uh, which was a fantastic place but um, a great opportunity came up with Moving Brands um, the very well-known branding agency and it was to work as design director with their new design realities team and um, that's a very exciting team that are doing lots of future facing work almost like speculative design uh, lots of work in AR and VR so I spent some time there, just a short stint. I was there for about three months when the role at Anyways popped up. And um, I just thought the Anyways might, Anyways might be a really good fit. Um, I'd always admired their work and um, the projects they do and the way they work, but also the way they spoke so openly and outwardly about um, collaboration and they really championed collaboration. And that was something that was really interesting to me. So, yeah, that was um, a year and two months ago now. So I've been at Anyways for just, just over a year. And yeah, it's been fantastic. It's been great. Brilliant. Oh, such an interesting journey that you had. I want to kind of pick a couple of part, uh, things yeah, apart yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, go deeper into this journey. Because I think when you obviously look back, it all looks very well thought through and planned yeah. and went to one agency <laughs> and then ended up in one of the best branding agencies and went into the newest and the coolest agency. So that's kind of a dream career for, for any designer or a creative person. Did you know when you were joining Kane and when you graduated what your career will be like and what the steps you need to take to, to get there? Absolutely not. Um, my, my course, what I studied at university, as I said, was so broad we had we had four modules I, I could I think it was typography image making um I can't even remember the other two now it was a long time ago but very quite classic graphic design but sort of melding things together so when I landed at Kin, I, I didn't know what an interaction design studio was um I I was quite surprised that such a place existed. Um, such a place did not exist in Ireland, in Dublin, where I was from. Um, so I really 
grew with that company and learned from that company and began to love it. And it was really interesting to, to realize that, oh, there are multidisciplinary design studios that are suited to me because I, I, I'm not a graphic designer. Um, and that is something that was kind of heralded as a way to go when you left my course. So I was very, very lucky in that I, I arrived at Kin and um, the circumstances allowed that. And so I grew with them. And then when I finished up at Kin, I was a little bit nervous that maybe other places like that didn't exist. I could see that they did through work people, people made, but I was a bit worried that my skills were a little bit haphazard and my portfolio was very mixed. And I had, uh, I, I was showing a portfolio that showed, for example, uh, an interactive installation at the Design Museum, but also I designed a series of maths books for primary schools and a, a graduation show for, for London College of Fashion. It was, it was quite mixed and, and I was nervous that perhaps Kin was an anomaly. Um, and it was strange to feel those nerves eight years into my career as a designer. Um, like I, I, I should have been seasoned, but also I had only been in this one place. But um, I was really pleasantly just surprised that there were lots of other opportunities out there. And I think more and more in the industry we work in, people do want rounded individuals who touch on this and that and have an eye for different things and can work with different people. Um, and yeah, it was great. I think it's to do with being in London as well. Very lucky to live in, to live and work in London, where there are plenty of opportunities available. But yeah, I, I was really pleased to find that that there were people looking for people like me, um, and that was really refreshing. And yeah, I, I I decided I didn't have to sort of skirt around my portfolio. Instead, I could I could talk through it in, in it, and it, it took some explaining, <laughs> but that was okay. Um, so yeah, and, and anyways is a great fit because we do, again, such varied work. Like I might be working across a campaign and some content creation and also an interactive installation at any one time. So it's fantastic to find another place that works in that way. Kin was very um, museum and cultural work. And now I'm much more in the branding world, but actually they cross over so much. So much of the work is the same type of work. Um, but just perhaps for a different type of client and telling a sort of a different story. Makes sense. Do you actually remember your interview with Anyways? What what did they ask? What how did it feel? And and yeah. also another question we've got from Shape Studio. What was the piece of your portfolio that actually stood out stood out for them? Ooh, well, there's lots in that. the The first thing is the first time I met Ellen, um, who is my manager and a senior creative at Anyways. I am. Um, arranged to go for a coffee with her, which is often what happens. It's something I found happens a lot in the creative industry. You go for coffees. And um, I met her in a, in a coffee shop near the studio. And it was the first time we met and I introduced myself and told her about myself. And then she asked to see some work. And I took out my laptop and um, I'd gotten through, I think, two projects when I spilled my whole cup of tea over my laptop. No and, way! <laughs> yeah. And I tried to kind of brush over it. I sort of picked up a napkin and sort of <laughs> patted it down. And Ellen was like, um, I think your your laptop is. And I was like, no, no, it'll be fine. And I tried to continue on. And then the laptop just went zoom and shut down completely. And um, oh, God, I was so flustered. This is the clumsiness. And um, to make matters worse, I was wearing, a I, I remember exactly the situation. I was wearing a pink jumper and white jeans. And Ellen invited me in to see the studio and my white jeans were just covered in tea. Um, I, I rang my boyfriend when I got out and I was just like, that could not have gone worse. <laughs> so I was very surprised to get an email from Ellen um, a week later inviting me in for the interview itself. So yeah, that, it worked out okay at the end. And I went in to have a formal interview. I had to borrow a laptop because the laptop was gone. The insurance company said it wasn't worth um, the damage done would cost more than replacing the laptop. So I had to borrow a laptop for um, the interview itself um, and head on into anyways a couple of weeks later. I think the piece of work that um, I was really proud of that I could talk about very fully at that time was a piece of work that I'd done for the Eden Project. 
um, and it was a piece of work I, I did at Kin. And um, yeah, it was um, three different interactive exhibits for um, an exhibition called Invisible Worlds at um, at the Eden Project. And it was just such a fantastic client. And it was all, all about um, learning about um, like microbiology. And um, I'd taken on this project from start to finish. At that time, it was quite a small team at Kin. So I really was very involved from coming up with the concepts to working with developers, to working with fabricators and to almost down to the details um, of doing like animations and illustrations myself. So it was a piece of work I was quite proud of and I was very comfortable in talking about at that interview. Really? And, and have you ever asked what, why did they hire you? What stood out for them? Or is it work? Is it your personality? Do you have any insight on that? Yeah, well, I think I think it was actually the stuff that I was nervous about. I was nervous about how varied my portfolio was and how I wasn't very specialist in a particular area. And instead that I felt my, my skills lay in collaborating with the right people, but I couldn't necessarily call myself an expert in a specific area. And that's something I was nervous about leaving kin, but it's actually what somewhere like Anyways um, is looking for because the heart of what we do is collaboration um, we find the right people to work with to make a project uh, happen and bring a project to life so yeah I think it was actually the stuff that I was a bit worried about that is what I anyways was looking for and um, yeah I think I, I do um, I do think I'm good working with the teams at anyways as well um, I'm an introvert but I also love working with people and working as part of a team and um, yeah, a lot, a lot of my job is, is working with teams to make to make these projects happen. And I have quite a bit of experience in education as well, in working in universities and hosting workshops and, and doing some guest lecturing. And that definitely comes into play with my job as well, working with the teams at Anyways. Brilliant. And, and you touched on such an interesting subject about the, the portfolio and the variety of work. Uh, and it actually doesn't matter how experienced you are, um, the, the type of work that you're doing, I feel like you always conscious throughout your life, am I doing the right work? Am I, is my portfolio too worried? Uh, is it, what shall I focus on? And I think those questions never disappear, at least never disappeared from my head. Uh, yeah. And uh, I don't know if you experienced the same, but I also noticed that the industry changed since, I don't know, when 15 years ago I was looking for jobs uh, there was this need for being good at one thing or or rather defining who you are. Who are we hiring? Are we hiring a graphic designer? Are we hiring, like, wh where will you be useful? And that was kind of a question that uh, was always there in the room. And my portfolio always was varied because I just had too many interests from illustration to to programming and and at that point those two didn't get along very well in people's heads uh, but uh, now I feel like because the industry is changing so fast then you kind of almost it, it's almost dangerous to be good at something because you might get very quickly uh, outdated in that thing because it might disappear or change or yeah, yeah. stop being needed do you feel like the industry is changing right now Absolutely. I mean, when I graduated 10 years ago now, as you say, it, it was, um, well, are you, are you a graphic designer? Are you an interaction designer? Are you a motion designer? Um, but yeah, the industry has changed so fast. And I guess that's a lot to do with the, the pace the world changes now as well. We, we expect different um, we expect different content and different visuals and different ways of seeing things uh, every day. And that moves so fast that as creatives and designers, we have to adapt to that um, in, in a way that is just so much faster than we used to. And yeah, I, I, don't get me wrong, I think, I think it's fantastic that there are, are experts out there and I work with those experts every day and that's what we do it anyways. We find specialists and experts, but then when you zoom out, you also need the designers or the creatives to look at bringing that all together. And I think that's almost a new role in the past. Well, I guess it's always been around, but it's a more prevalent role now that you have these people who look to bring those people and ideas together in the right way to make whatever needs to happen happen and as well with regards to clients clients expect more as well now they they, they come to agencies like ours and they know that they want a thing to happen but they're happy to hand it over to you to decide how that might come to life and that's really exciting and that's because we have 
so many options available, um, like interactive installations or activations. They weren't so much a thing five years ago. And now like we will have clients come to us and they might say, oh, we want to we want to get across this message or we want to advertise this product. And that could be a print campaign. It could be an online website. It could be an activation. It could be, I don't know, a song. Um, and it's very difficult if you're a specialist in that instance to respond to that. But instead, we need these new types of people who are able to just like think wider and then find out how to solve that problem. Um, so, yeah, I do think it's definitely there are more and more opportunities for the, the generalist and the, and the multidisciplinary type of brain or person um, to fill that role for sure. Uh, I love it. And I love how you mentioned the, the kind of the request the clients uh, come with, because uh, I agree the co clients, um, some clients do come for, for a poster or a, a website, but you very quickly through conversation understand that there is a, a need uh, that is bigger than that. And it's always good to go back and ask, uh, OK, how, how can we deliver on this need? And from the work that Anyways Creative does, uh, you kind of see the variety of uh, of talent you have and also the open-mindedness of the creatives uh, that you have and just the some of those examples that we mentioned at the beginning about the Pinterest and the central experience uh, to Adobe creative types which is a very it's kind of between tech and moving image and psychology so it's yeah. kind of uh, and social media on top of that so it's quite interesting to see how uh, you guys think about brands in a very different way. Can we talk a little bit more about the process of creating those types of campaign? Because on one hand, it's very liberating to do anything. On another hand, it's almost paralyzing when essentially you can do anything. You're not just a, a web design agency or a, or a branding agency that just does a, a more kind of a static brand identity. You, you do everything. Um, and I don't know if, you, if we take, let's say, Sonus as an example uh, and go through the process. What did they come with as a, as a challenge or problem, what they wanted to do and how did yeah. you go through the process? Yeah, so uh, with Sonus, they, they, yeah, they wanted to... Um, speak about their collaboration with the Google Assistant and introduce the Google Assistant on the Sana speakers. And um, the, yeah, it, they, they were really open to any suggestions as to how we might do that. And that's actually one of the examples I was referring to that, that they, they said it could be digital, it could be physical, it could be online, it could be offline. Um, and it was, the, the pitch was actually before my time, but what we'll often do is sort of a, a tissue session where we'll come up with lots of what if ideas and, and present like all the wild and wonderful ideas at this stage, because at this early stage, it doesn't have to be too feasible. It's more yeah. just about showing <laughs> your thinking process. And that could be the most fun stage for sure. And I think at that stage, you can kind of gauge how open a client is to, to pushing things in a certain direction. I think when you do have that opportunity at that early stage to present all of these wild and wonderful ideas, you can sort of get a feel for, okay, do they actually want to do um, something a bit out there or did they really want a website? They just thought they would throw this idea around at the beginning. But with Sonos, they, were, they, they really wanted to push the boundaries and come up with something really exciting. So once you, get, once you establish that relationship with the client, I think it's much easier to then, to then move on to that next stage and figure out, okay, what are we going to do here? And sure, it, it can be very overwhelming, but I think what we do it anyways is um, we'll have quite clear stages of work. So we usually have four stages in work in a project. And, and that first stage is like a discover stage really about like, casting that net wide, coming up with all those ideas and um, figuring out all the possibilities. But then we'll have a finite period of time to do that. And then we start honing in and figuring out what's feasible and what what might work here and, and how would we bring that to life and who would we collaborate with. And I think what makes it easier is just establishing that really strong relationship with the client as well, because with regular check-ins and by, by involving them in the process, if they're open to that, you can gauge what's going to work for them and what they're open to. And with Sonos, yeah, they, 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 were, really, they were really open to this idea of a, an activation, a physical activation. And um, that's the route that they decided upon. We had presented loads of options in that, in that initial stage, but when we moved it down to, let's say, three ideas, we decided on, on an activation. And then we kind of narrow in and in and in on what that actual idea is. What's the core concept? How are we going to bring it to life? What's involved? 
And um, yeah, in the end, it was this um, this experience that was a, a sonic and experience at, at heart, but also um, a, a physical experience, three interactive rooms that you would move through and um, sort of told the story of sound in a really interesting way. And yeah, that took place in New York and London. Brilliant. I mean, it, it looks mesmerizing. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to attend, but from the videos and pictures that I've seen, it's just, it's so beautiful and so well executed and thought through. And the, the, the creativity is pure sense when you actually want to be in a space and want to interact with something. So it's just fantastic. Um, so th this process that you again went through, it, it's, it seems very simple, but I can imagine it is not. Um, what would you say is the, the biggest challenge? Uh, I suppose we can say this project is an example. What was the most difficult part for you as a creative person as well? Um, I think the biggest challenge for Sonos was um, that uh, initially we were creating something in New York. Um, so we were coming up with these ideas for... Um, interactive rooms and um, hanging light sculptures and, and sonic sculptures that people would interact with and spaces people would move around to move through the sound. But we were coming up with this around a table in Hagerston and um, we were not in New York in our space. <laughs> so the initial hurdle was finding a space in New York and, and there was some traveling back and forth and, and securing a venue. But then even when you secure the venue, um, and you know those specs and we build out a 3D model and but you're not there <laughs> you're not in that space and so that was a challenge for us we were working with some incredible collaborators Dave and Gabe who are uh, um, a duo based in Brooklyn and they're um, interactive installation artists but they're also sound artists so they were the perfect collaborator for us and they started building out our, our creative, our ideas, um, and helping us on the designs. So, for example, the first room was a, a, a room that was visualizing the physics of sound. And it was, it was, it was filled with um, nearly 2,000 LED bulbs. Um, and there was 18 speakers. And it was creating this, this 3D audio experience that you would walk through and you would also see the sound. The sound was animating across the lights. And um, the second room had these five sculptures that, that broke Ryland by the National, the song, um, out into its component part, parts. So these sculptures, they, um, one was, for example, playing the bass and one was playing the vocals and one was playing the piano. And they lit up as that part of the song played. And that sculpture was just playing that part of the song. So it was very exploratory. You'd move up and you would listen into the bass guitar and you could hear that or you might move across to the vocals. And it was very exploratory and it meant that every visitor sort of experienced that room in their own way. That was difficult because um, it's hard to design something like that, as I said, in the studio and then um, not be able to experience it or, or see it brought to life until very close to the time. David Gay built these these um, sculptures and these rooms out to scale in the, this amazing space in Brooklyn called Future Space. It's a, sort of like a, a collaborative that they share with other makers. But it, it was it was quite soon before the activation when we saw these things to scale, and we were delighted that they had done an amazing job. But even at that, we're still seeing them in a different space, and right up to the wire, it, it's quite nerve wracking that. We, we don't know how these things are going to feel and work and, and, and will they feel the way we anticipated when they come to life in the venue itself, which really happens because of the way <laughs> installs work the, a couple of days before the thing goes live. But it, it worked out really well. Again, it was down to working with fantastic collaborators like Dave and Gabe and also Bednark Studios who built out the space. And we were re really lucky in that the process was quite smooth. But that's the tricky thing about installations and activations in general, but particularly when you're working in a different country. Oh, wow. It seemed like such a complex project, especially because there are so many different elements and definitely not being in the space. Uh, I only can imagine how psychologically diff difficult that was <laughs> in terms of creativity. Do you remember when you actually first experienced it, you've, you've seen the, the final finished product and project? What, what did you feel? What thoughts did you have at that point? Oh, it was, it was fantastic. Yeah, I'll never forget it. I, I 
we walked through as a team through all the rooms and it's quite a, the idea was that this activation would be quite a sensory overload. So it was very visual, but also this booming songs playing as you move through it. And it was just brilliant. And to be honest, there's, there's nothing quite like that. That's, that's one of my favorite type of projects just because of the amazing sense of satisfaction when something does come together in that way. And um, you can experience it in the flesh and it makes you feel the way you had hoped it would make you feel. That That's great. <laughs> Amazing. Did you go and celebrate with the team? What was the oh, yeah. <laughs> celebratory uh, ritual? Yeah, we had lots of great food and drink in New York um, about this time last year, actually. It's funny thinking about that now. Uh, we were working hard as, as an install. Uh, always, You always have to work quite hard on an install, but you can generally have some really nice dinners in the evening and a few drinks as well, especially when you're celebrating. So all good. <laughs> Amazing. Oh, sounds great. And you started talking about collaboration as, as a big part of anyways, but also this particular project. And, and I agree that that is uh, the future and the present of creative industry. And I always say that London is especially famous for that and good at it, probably because of the size of the industry and because of the, I suppose, rent as well, because you can't have a big, massive studio that does everything. Yeah. You yeah. most likely will be at tiny studio that collaborates with lots of other tiny studios and create the best work and that's what I personally love about London and creative industry here. Are there any insights on collaboration or now that you've collaborated with so many different people and artists what works and what doesn't and any advice if uh, any of our listeners are running an agency and want to collaborate with another agency and an artist what would be your advice or what you did wrong that you learned from as well? Um, well, we're in the very lucky position that we're, um, we're the sister agency of It's Nice That, um, the editorial platform that I'm sure lots of people know. So from the offset, we have this amazing network of um, collaborators through It's Nice That and, and we share a studio uh, like with uh, It's Nice That and also Lecture in Progress. And if you could, we're also we're all part of the Hudson Beck group. So we collaborate with each other and then we also collaborate with the wider world. I think with regards to advice, um, as I said, it's it's in our DNA. It's the way we operate. It's it's the way we create our work. It's the way we create, I think, our best work. And so I think my advice is just to be brave, to, to not always go to the expected people, to cast a net wide, to start conversations. Um, at any ways, we work with so many different types of people, um, the expected types of people, like maybe typographers or animators or illustrators. But what we encourage as well is just constantly meeting maybe more unexpected people. We really encourage um, like inviting people into the studio for a chat. Like I, I know a few weeks ago we had some people in and they they design like edible perfumes. And um, I also met with an amazing guy who was making these sort of mini computers that sit up in the trees in the forest and record the, the sounds of the wow. forests and it's a, it's a reaction to global warming. And I, th I think my advice is just to meet as many people as possible and, and not even when a project asks for it. If you can keep those conversations up throughout the year, then, then they, will spark, they will spark ideas and you might go back to that person when a project arises. Because I think, I think we can all get in the habit of, of working with the same types of people um over and over again but what starts to be really interesting is when you think outside the box and you think oh well who could we actually collaborate on this project to make it really different to make it stand out and i think it harks back to that point we were saying earlier about the world constantly changing and we expect so much and brands expect so much so if you could really mix things up and create something a little bit unexpected and work with people that teach you something then it's going to result in just more exciting work and we're always trying to create adventurous work and, and that's what keeps us out of our comfort zone is like mixing things up and, and finding ways to work with, with new and exciting people. Oh, I totally agree with you. As you know, Future Learning Academy's mission is to connect people from around the world and all the communities around the world, uh, because I feel like that's uh, the best way to start those collaborations just by connecting to people, by hearing stories, by being in the same space or having a, an Instagram live with lots of people yeah. and hearing everyone's uh, stories and journeys, because I think you learn so much and you get so many ideas just from 
being around people who are doing something different from you. Yeah. Um, and uh, actually, you, you will be part of the future of branding week. It is so, so important for, I think, any creative to constantly get out there and meet other creative people and, and hear what they're working on, how they're working on things. And I think that uh, kind of makes everyone better, which is kind of a crazy yeah. thing. Why don't we all do it if it kind of benefits everyone? Um, and in particular, I wanted to ask you about the, the kind of the new things that you do and also how you approach these people. Because another thing that I find very, very interesting about the work that you do is this unconventional approach to channels and technologies and, and things that you create. Uh, and, and you said it correctly that uh, the usual impulse is always to go to the same people or do the same thing you've done experience for sonas let's do a, a, a light and music experience for someone else just because it worked well you know what to expect doing something that you've never done before is always difficult and getting ideas that you've never done before is always difficult so how do you personally stay open-minded and where do you find this um new technologies inspiration for for art for for new things or when these people come to, to you for a coffee, is it more of an organized process? They give a talk to your entire agency and it's part of your culture. Is it something that you do yourself? Um, well, we, yeah, we would just organize quite casual coffees. We're always, our door is always open at any ways to, to meet people. We, we would usually, maybe a couple of us would meet someone. Um, and yeah we just set up a set up a time and invite people into the studio when possible um, they we, we wouldn't ask them to present to the whole studio we try to keep it a little bit more informal um, and it's something yeah we really encourage across the board it, it doesn't have to be senior members of the team um, and it doesn't have to be creatives like project managers will often invite people in as well and um, yeah that's just a that's just it's it's part of our culture and it's something that we really encourage um and we try to keep that going all the time so as i said it's not doesn't have to be necessarily related to a live project um and yeah that that's just that's an amazing way to find inspiration um by talking to to people and and um yeah sort of uh i i i, I the way i think of it is like the more people you talk to the more you're going to information you're going to collect that you can sort of rejig in your mind into new ideas and then perhaps go back to these people to work with them as well but yeah, that, that's where I find a lot of my inspiration in, in talking to new and exciting people and hearing about what they do and how that might work with what I do and what we do and what other people I know do and, and trying to fit those pieces together. Amazing. I love it. And actually, I went to see Will as well at some point, I think a couple of years ago, he invited me as part of one of these conversations and we talked about, I think it was before a lecture in progress, so that probably had been a while ago. Uh, and we talked about the role of education and inspiration and uh, definitely uh, discussed a lot of things that we both felt passionate about. And I remember just feeling very energized and feeling uh, great about um, having someone else to talk to about things that I just love and I feel very en energized about and I feel passionate about. So, um, yeah, I think the experience and the result of the experience is always great. So I would encourage everyone to meet other people. It's just fantastic. Yeah. I have one more question that you touched upon a little bit uh, about the role of education because you do teach at universities and you do a lot of portfolio reviews as well. Um, and it feels like this kind of, this is part of your, I don't know, DNA and what you do. Um, why do you do it and what do you get out of it? Uh, why would you encourage other people to do it? Um, so what, what, what's your thoughts behind it? Yeah, well, I think, I think it's so important for the creative industries to just have that link with universities or schools or just young creatives because they know what's coming. They are the future talent and they are the fresh people in our industry. And it's great to, great to, give back in some way as well. But really I think what's more interesting and the reason that uh, I make sure I personally do it is because it shakes me up. It makes me think in a completely different way. I, I work with teams every day at Anyways and across different projects. But when I have to go into a university and um, perhaps I'll, set, I'll be doing a workshop and I'll set a brief and then I have to go around and speak to students, it, it keeps me on my toes. Um, I have to flick to a different part of my brain and um, 
I have to be fast and I have to respond and I have to sound like I know what I'm talking about. And I find it really energizing <laughs> and it's so tiring, but I find it very good for me. And um, if I do that once every few months, it's a good jolt for me. Um, and of course, it's great to, to help out and, and be part of that and be part of education. But on a very personal level, it just it, it really keeps me on my toes. And I think that's really, really useful. Um, I think if you can, it's a great thing to be involved in uh, because it gives you it gives you a little bit of time as well to reflect on how you think and how you work and how you're doing. And um, it just it just it just takes you out of your comfort zone for a day or two days and makes you have to reevaluate those things and think in a different way and be fast. <laughs> Oh, I totally agree. And I, I can relate to both sides. I remember being on the other side when I was a young designer and I remember people who gave me advice and I was so grateful for their time to just look at my portfolio and say something, even if it was a small thing, just give some guidance. And I remember how powerful and useful that was. And on another side, I also feel like teaching and I also do lots of lectures and I feel like it helps me to learn as well Yeah, uh, because for sure. you have to structure your knowledge, you have to re reflect back on how you do things uh, and uh, yeah that makes you think uh, in a very different way which is which is amazing. Yeah, it really does yeah and it goes to both ways like when you're chatting to students you, you will learn so much from them and they are, hopefully they're getting something from me as well but I'm definitely learning lots from them too. <laughs> Amazing. We have a couple of questions about the future, the future of technology and in general, I suppose, because you're always talking to these amazing people, you probably have a better insight. What do you feel like, especially in the context of brands and branding, what are interesting things that are happening and what should we expect in the future and look into? I think augmented reality is going to be a really big thing. Not so much virtual reality, of course, it's huge and really important, but I do think augmented reality is the next big step for a lot of brands. Uh, just adding this extra layer and this really exciting way of um, bringing a digital layer to a physical space. Um, I think that's something that has been really exciting and interesting over the past five, ten years, this merging of physical and digital. For example, Sonos or other work we've done, that's what brings those digital layers into a physical space. But augmented reality is really exciting because it can be in your home, you can have this device in your pocket that that does that for you. And I do think that's going to be really exciting for brands and also in the wider world in so many different industries as well. Um, and I, I also think um, something we've been thinking about a lot in the studio is like uh, activations and digital installations have been really exciting and brands are really getting involved in those a lot at the moment. But I think as the world changes, we're going to think of new and interesting ways to, to do them that um just mix things up a little bit like how, how do we how do we work in spaces and, and interrupt spaces in, in new and exciting ways so that it's kept really fresh um perhaps that's not quite to do with technology but I, I do think how we build out spaces and how we um make a mark on spaces that will need that that will need some more thinking and will develop further over the next few years um yeah, and I guess in the more uh, imminent future, some people are using doing great things with uh, Zoom and slides and um, platforms like that to create content. I've seen some great stuff out there recently. <laughs> oh wow, that's an interesting thought. Uh, so, what what have you seen happening on on Zoom in terms of brands and activations? Uh, well, not so much um, activations, but yeah, we were sharing around the the beautiful title slides for the the Creative Festival Playground, I think it's called. And the director, um, he he had to make this this title sequence in the current confines and in during lockdown. And then he used Zoom as his platform to do that. And he worked with 22 other people. And um, so he made this sort of stop motion animation where uh, these, these 22 people on a Zoom call would hold up these beautiful patterns and colors and gorgeous typography and just created this amazing title sequence uh, with Zoom as the tool. Um, yeah, and then on a more lighthearted note, I really enjoyed uh, Ryan Reynolds, who just bought Mint Media, I think it's called, the the phone, the mobile phone um, brand. That. And he made this amazing advertisement from his home. It's really funny and well worth a watch. 
<laughs> yeah, I think he's a good original creator. Um, I think everything that he does on social media, I think it's just worth, uh, yeah, looking at. <laughs> he's he's very very creative. Um, a couple of last questions that people are asking around portfolio and being noticed, and uh, just in general, how to get noticed? Do you feel like right now is as a designer, maybe to get hired by anyways or to get to collaborate with anyways, and in general, as an independent artist or designer, how to get noticed? Yeah, I think um, I think the first thing is about being brave to reach out for to to studios and companies that might not be hiring, and to just send through your work or maybe ask to go for a coffee. And um, yeah, it's something that I didn't realize quite so much when I was a when I was a recent graduate that um, you would trawl through the sites looking for internship opportunities or or open vacancies. But I think the best thing to do is to whittle down companies that you'd be really interested in working with and to reach out for them, out to them. And that's not to say they'll all be able to meet you, but that's the first step in, in making that leap and, and trying to meet the people you really want to meet. Um, and with regards to portfolios, um, some advice I often give is, I think I think it's important to to find those projects that you really believe in and to to learn them and learn how to speak about them and to really champion those projects. And you don't have to go in with a really full wide portfolio, but instead present that work that you believe in and that you, you find really interesting. And sometimes we meet with people and maybe they want to talk about just one specific project and that could be okay too. Maybe, maybe that's what's really interesting and that's what you want to talk about. And, and that's absolutely fine. And, um, I think the other thing with regards to getting noticed and, and um, portfolios is is just about practicing. I think it can be quite intimidating to meet new people and talk about your portfolio. I mean, the last time I did it, I knocked a cup of tea over my laptop, so I clearly wasn't feeling overly confident. Um, so I think it's really good to just sit at home and practice and, and learn how you talk about your own work. It's something I had to do after eight years in the industry when I left Kin. Um, I was a senior designer and I, I knew what I did, but I needed to start talking about my work and learn how to do that in a confident way and in a way that portrayed the work in its best light. Because so often we see work that we know is great work, but if its creator isn't talking about it in a way that describes it really well and really confidently, it's difficult to, to penetrate it and it's difficult to understand and it's difficult to to then feel feel good about moving forward with 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 a piece of work or that person ah oh, that those are really great pieces of advice and i wish someone told that to me <laughs> i think definitely i think see you can always see the passion be behind the person's work so picking the projects that you generally feel passionate about and you want to talk about makes a big big difference and sometimes the most uh mundane projects when people start talking about the process and all the different things that happen kind of gives you much more understanding about their person's skills and passions and what they're capable of than the project that might look uh, really well designed but actually have no story behind them. Sure, yeah, exactly. Uh, brilliant. So we are unfortunately running out of time, but I wanted to finish up with the last question, sure. which is... Um, Imagine yourself 10 years ago. Uh, first of all, where were you? What were you doing 10 years ago? And then if you could give advice to yourself about anything um, 10 years ago, what would it be? Um, so 10 years ago, I was just about to move to London, um, which is crazy. I can't believe I've been here 10 years. Um, yeah, I was about to move into an awful flat in Hoxton with a very leaky roof. Um, and I think the advice I would give myself would be to not get so hung up on on getting it perfect, getting it right, and, and really hitting that mark first time round. Um, I think I am so much more successful in my creative career when I let myself be a little bit more free and don't get so hard on my don't go so hard on myself and I had to relearn that lesson again a couple of years ago when I when I when I joined anyways and when I went to moving brands and when I left Kim that that not to be so hard on myself about trying to find this one specific type of job and trying to pigeonhole my whole myself into a certain type of role or um trying to label myself that like it's okay to just figure out who I am and what all those parts of me entail 
Um, and I think that's a very difficult thing to do when you're young. And I'm still not quite there yet, to be honest, but I'm getting better at it. <laughs> that's a brilliant advice. And I, I totally agree. I don't think anyone ever figures out who they are, but uh, the, the, to giving yourself a permission to be okay with that and let your creative life go and see it as a process of figuring out who you are and what you should do. I think that's a great way to think about it. Thank you so, so much, Claire. It was such a pleasure talking to you. And um, thanks, everyone, for joining us and asking questions and, and listening to our conversation. Um, I'm really excited about meeting you, hopefully, in person during the Future Branding Week. And everyone who is not signed up for Anyways Creative on Instagram, please go right now and sign up, follow their creative work. It's incredible. It's super inspiring and definitely very, very different from your traditional branding agency. So you will get a lot of new and great ideas from the work that uh, their team does. Well, thanks a lot. And if you're not following Futureland Academy yet, definitely sign up, uh, follow us on Instagram for more creative conversations with wonderful people like Claire and wonderful creative agencies, illustrators, designers, innovators, and just people who are doing great stuff. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.